Welcome to my virtual campfire. I'm Crystal Kelly. It is times like these that our ancestors would have started telling stories around a campfire, searching for meaning in our existence. We all have our Corona stories to tell. Think of our phone as the warm glow of a virtual campfire. Each week, listen to stories from all over the world about how we as humans fit into the vibrations of mother nature and the universe. Collectively, let's co-create a future through conversation and storytelling and music with love. I have like all these questions. I've heard stories about you over the years and I've never really sat down and talked one-on-one with you about your adventures. And, um, and so I feel like I have so many questions. I kind of don't know where to start. But what I was told is that you went somewhere and became a Buddhist monk and meditated for a few years. Like, what part of that is right? Some of that's true. I didn't become a Buddhist monk. I hung out with a lot of Buddhist monks, but I could have probably. But no, I wasn't that dedicated. But I definitely Mm -hmm. um, started the journey. I guess we can launch in there. Yeah. Is I mean... Because I there's so many questions like that lead up to that. Like, what made you kind of just drop out of society and go to where'd you go? Well, I moved into a a house in San Francisco that was like a Buddhist community. It wasn't a full on monastery per se, but there was monks and nuns living there. And I just said, all right, let's let's go for it. And rented a room and started hanging out and then went on retreats. We did a annual retreat in the Lake District in England every year. And then we would do other smaller retreats within Northern California. But prior to that, to leading up to that, kind of a segue, is what got me all interested was I was having these crazy panic anxiety attacks. And was just like, couldn't wrap my head or my mind around it, you know, and it was all like, okay, medication based. And I was going to this really cool therapist who was all about mindfulness. And he, he turned me on to this book. He's all, you've got to read this. It was called Being Peace by Thich Nhat Hanh. Okay. Are you, fami- are you familiar with I, him? Yes, I'm familiar with his, with not that book, but uh, with him as an author. Yeah. Yeah. So he's this amazing uh, Vietnamese Buddhist monk. That was super active in the uh, Vietnam War and was just this walking, beautiful presence of just peaceful being. And um, I think he was one of the first to start to resonate with the West. And uh, so I read that book. I was like, wow, this is powerful stuff. Mindfulness, walking meditation, being present. I mean, it all sounded good, but fucking easier said than done, right? (laughs) <laughs> totally so so like two weeks later i go back for my next appointment he's all kevin you gotta you gotta hear this news Thich Nhat han is leading the retreat in saratoga which is like an hour and a half from san francisco i'm going with my girlfriend you should look into it now, my first thought is well that'll be trippy hanging out with my therapist at a retreat but he's a cool <laughs> dude and i'm just like sure so I go, uh, I mean, this is pre-internet shit. This is like late 90s. Maybe internet was rolling then. Shit, I don't know. A little bit. Little bit, yeah. yeah. Uh, 56K dial-up. Yeah, right? yeah. Yeah, AOL. <laughs> oh, yeah, you've got mail. Right. So exactly. anyway, I, I get the phone number, I go to the link, and um, it's totally full. It's totally sold out. And I'm like, God damn it. Once again day late dollar short and i'm just like okay can i get on a waiting list and they're like sure so i got on a waiting list and it's like a four-day retreat but i'm just like screw it i'm just gonna show up and just roll the dice and hopefully i get in and um you know there's no app to check in or shit back then so I, I roll down to Saratoga, beautiful setting in kind of the Redwoods. And I roll up to the registration desk and they're like, can we have your name? Check in, yada, yada, yada. I'm like, well, I'm on the waiting list. And um, they check my name. Long story short, boom, 
sorry, there's no spots available. But I brought all my camping gear because all the uh, all the uh, huts and whatever they were using, you know, the uh, kind of uh, yeah, like their rooms were full. Thank but, you. Yeah. Thank you. The rooms were full. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, screw it. I'm just going to poach this thing and go camp in the woods. And until I get kicked out or told I can't come, I'm just going to go because I'm like in the presence of holiness. <laughs> I love it. So I'm just like, screw it. I go set up my tent and um, just started going to the teachings. Like there was a, you know, he would do morning talks and then we would have a silent, the rest of the days, like you're supposed to be silent with everybody. So we would have silent meals, total mindfulness. It's perfect. No one could kick you out if everyone had to be quiet. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> yeah, I just started going and I ran into my therapist and he's just all, you know, thumbs up. And we did these beautiful afternoon um, walks. Like, I think there was like a total of 200 people and we did this walking mindfulness. So you're doing these very slow, step by step, taking in all your surroundings, being at one with nature. And he's leading us all through the woods and everyone's holding hands and it's just a trip. We're just like blissed out in the woods. <laughs> and I was hooked. I was like, this is the shit. I'm like, I'm getting a good hit off of this. So, but the in the back of my mind, I was like, what are the implications of me sneaking in and poaching this? I mean, what are the karma? <laughs> Ooh, yeah, totally. So I'm like, okay, I, I guess I can start to volunteer in the kitchen. But looking back on it, Crystal, it was a very, very selfish endeavor. It was what, what can I get out of this? Okay. So that was like, in hindsight, I'm like, dude, that wasn't cool. You yeah. Know? So you had, you kind of had um, like intentions that were uh, not as one, you know, like, like, like I am you and you are me, you know, like we are mm -hmm. one, but you, you were having intentions that, that weren't along those thinking lines. So, so you were kind of a little bit like an outsider trying to like, you're kind of like a spy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the mole. I was the meditation you're the mole. mole. Yeah. You know, in a sense, yes. I mean, as much as I want to say that I was community based, I mean, looking back and being completely honest with myself and with you, it was very selfish. Like, what can I get out of this to, to lessen my anxiety, to become whole again? Mm -hmm. And although I did resonate with people and, and hung out and, um, but it was like, I kept thinking, okay, how can I get these tapings? How can I get this? What can I take away from this? And just so I, my takeaway was like, okay, I want more of this, but there was no, he's based his Songha community. He was in a place called Plum Village in France. Okay. And um, I don't think they had any um, hubs in the States yet. So I, I was left hungry for more. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started doing more research in San Francisco and found out about this community called Saraha Buddhist Community that I ended up getting tuned into and they were in San Francisco. I'm like, shit, they're right here in my backyard. I can resonate with this song, how community. So I started going to these um, teachings and it was completely different. Whereas Thich Nhat Hanh is very Zen based, very just kind of chill in tune. And I go to these, uh, they were doing like two hour meditation classes with all these tonkas and paintings and wrathful deities, just these <laughs> ominous, crazy looking critters, like demon like Buddhas, right? But they were like the protectors. Okay. I'm, look, I'm looking at all this shit, just going, I'm raised Catholic. You're not, you're not, a, you're not allowed to uh, worship other, other gods, right? Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. F you the Catholic church. I'm going to, I'm going to go for this. And it was full on, like we're doing mantras and doing the beads and it was very engaging and very interactive. And I was like, all right. And then the, 
I don't know, a couple months into it, they're like, hey, we've got a room opening up. If you would like to get more involved and more in depth, um, why don't you move in? It's like 400 bucks. I'm like, in a beautiful neighborhood in San Francisco, St. Francis Woods, overlooking the ocean. I'm like, I can surf, I can meditate. Okay. But once again, in my heart, I wasn't in as the community. I was like, what can I get out of this? And, um, but sometimes, like, the more I hear of your story, um, it's making me think that, uh, sometimes the, the, when you think the motivation is selfish, it actually isn't because you have to heal yourself before you can become a part of the community. So in a way, like it might feel like you're being selfish, but you just aren't quite there yet to be like all inclusive until you can fully heal. Does that make sense? No, that totally makes sense, Crystal. And I think deep down, that was my motivation. Like, you know, they call it the Bodhisattva path where mm -hmm. you're in it for others, you know? And you, yeah. and, and you get all the benefits from being a Bodhisattva because you're helping others. Your instant reward is, is you're getting gratification from just helping. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, so I was like, okay, let's try to, let's try to, uh, do a 180 here and put yourself in the back seat. So I got more involved, you know, started being more assistant cooking, hanging out, um, you know, helping out hosting classes and whatnot. Room to my room was a was a younger Buddhist monk who had just um, ordained. Like he was like 20 something, this young kid who just thought this was his path. And he was all in like full on in robes. I would come home after going out. I mean, I was still going out and, you know, hanging out with my friends. It wasn't like you were secluded to this environment. So I would go out, you know, meet for drinks, come back kind of buzzed. And walk through the door and there he is just sitting in full lotus just candles lit just blissed out big smile on his face like <laughs> he he was having a way better time than i was and then i go into my room and i'm just like okay what do i do now and i'm like okay and i find myself just doing devious shit you know <laughs> just to be like the other end of the spectrum like this is too holy this is too pure yeah, you totally became the rebel Buddha. There you go. Yeah. So, but I hung in there. I hung in there and uh, we had a new resident teacher come over from Brazil and he was so enthusiastic. He was like, you're my mission. I'm going to, I'm going to convert you. And um, the rebel in me was like, okay, all right, let's do it. So wait, that brings up a really interesting question to me. The word choice that you made with convert. Do, do you think that uh, Buddhism is a religion? Well, at the time, at the time when I was in it, yes. But now, okay. no. Okay, cool. I, I mean, was just I wondering because it was yeah, interesting. Good, no, very good question because, I mean, now it's more of a, a philosophy of a mindset. That's how Whereas, I think of it. You know, like the Dalai Lama is like, you don't have to be a Buddhist to, to reap the rewards of kindness and, and um, mm -hmm. generosity. Like, come one, come all. And that, that resonated with me more than anything. But I was in the uh, Mah Mahayana tradition, which was a lineage of the Dalai Lama. And uh, our quote unquote guru, just the word guru, right? Uh huh. You know, the head teacher, the Lama, whatever you want to call it, was dictating all the teachings. And it was like an honor to be in his presence. And um, that part tripped me out like, okay, like bowing down, like almost cultish. Mm hmm. Like, you know, he's converting all these young kids to become monks, to go out and spread the word, which is awesome. But mm -hmm. at their young age, it was just insane. They had to shave their heads, buy robes, give up all their worldwide possess possessions. And uh, I guess for a lot of these kids who didn't know what the hell they were doing, it was very appealing, mm -hmm. you know. But for me, I was like, nah, I can't go there just yet. 
and uh, but I met some wonderful people. So I want to I want to reflect back that this was, in the long run, some very generous, deep connections with people mm -hmm. that I still still am in touch with to the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, after living in that house, where did where did what was the next kind of path that that you went on? So we would do these uh, annual retreats in um, in England, in the Lake District. We had these beautiful old priory um, castles mm -hmm. and these huge grounds. So people from all over the world would come there. So they had centers all throughout the world, Brazil, um, Europe, South America, um, everywhere, Australia. So people would converge there and hang out. So I would still go to those and still go to teachings. I moved out and got a place down by the beach and um, realized that I needed to separate myself from being so into it, like so 24-7, mm -hmm. you're waking up. We're doing like 6 a.m. pujas in the morning, you know, doing chanting, which is a good way to start the day. But then you're like, okay, I got to carry on this mindset throughout the whole day because I'm here and it's like, ooh, challenging. So um, I have a question. When you were doing your the pujas and stuff, the other people were wearing like monk robes. What were you wearing? Oh, I mean, the majority of us are lay people. Like, okay. I would say maybe ten percent were ordained. Gotcha. Okay. I think I think there was four monks and two nuns living in the house, and then there was probably like eight of us that were lay people. Okay. And then I, they I'm would, just trying to get a mental picture here. Yeah, no, no, no. But they had a full on dedicated like shrine room, you know, beautiful statues and tonkas and uh, mandalas, beautiful artwork, right? I mean, cool. so many people have done tattoos of all the um, deities, you know, like mm -hmm. Tara's the mother, you know, yeah. the green, green Tara. Green Tara. Yep. And Tara's, then you, Tara's, Tara's, you've Tara's. got you know all the different deities and you got the really wrathful ones which look really cool uh i'm not rocking any ink so i can't show any but mm -hmm. um but then the uh teacher was like the the guru was like that's not that's not good not good to, to be displaying that kind of stuff and we made t-shirts and he's all you've got to put it in your dirty laundry you don't put a, a, a buddha in dirty laundry do you you want to Oh, I see. Hold him in high regards. So he's just like, no more t-shirts. I discourage you guys getting tattoos. You know, this is a very sacred practice not to be yeah. taken lightly. So that part of me was like, okay. But I mean, we would do these full on like a uh, hundred syllable mantras that you would just, and you know, go on these retreats. <laughs> we would do um, where you, I forget the exact name, but you go in on a weekend retreat to learn the the background and the history of say like medicine buddha or vajrasattva who is the uh the cleansing buddha um, and then you would learn the mantra learn the background and then do like a private week-long retreat just you know reciting these mantras over and over again so trippy stuff fun yeah trippy. yeah so does any part of what you do and i actually don't exactly know what you do um now I, either do i for that matter <laughs> <laughs> try to help as many people as i can through these disasters but at the same time you're having to sift through all the other stuff yeah so like do you think that you're still feeling of service to people Have, has that has that stayed constant like do you want do you want to continue like on a mindful path on a compassionate path oh i mean yeah it's never left me by any means i mean it's always kind of been you know in the backdrop or in the back of my mind like at the end of the day i don't want to i don't want to be angry i don't want to hold grudges i don't i mean all the philosophies of say like you know just you know the dalai lama just she, being a good person at the end of the day take inventory so that's my goal nowadays and just borrowing pieces of this teaching, that teaching, mindfulness, breath work, um, you know, whereas in the Buddhist, they're like, 
you got to be hardcore to our tradition. Don't mess around. Like I would bring in books from Jack Cornfield. Are you familiar with Jack Cornfield? Yeah, I love Jack Cornfield. Jack Cornfield's awesome, right? He's one of my favorite authors. Yeah, yeah, he's funny. I've seen him. I've been to a few of his retreats and checked him out in Marin County at yep. um, Esalen. Spirit Rock. Oh, at Spirit Rock. Okay. Spirit Rock. So uh, that's a great Zen setting too. Yeah. And uh, I had like his books and these people were like, what are you doing bringing in these outside teachings? I'm like, well, I'm just integrating it. And they're like, not cool, man, not cool. And I'm just thinking to myself, F you, like, who are you to tell me not to be? Yeah. So that part started. That's when I probably kicked out of. I'm like, this is a little cultish. Like they're preaching too much, trying to dictate. And I'm just like, I'm out of here. Yeah. I mean, that, that practice. Yeah. So it, all in all, I was probably in it for like six years. Wow. I mean, not not living at the place, but, you know, like trying to stay faithful to that practice. Yeah. And um, there was a lot of fallout. You would see different people coming and going, and then the monks would never last more than a year because they were so young. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. So... But then you would see them at the retreats as a lay person and they would be like, oh my God, I feel so much better. Yeah. I can be human and still practice, but still have a girlfriend. And, um, you know, cause you could, you would take these precepts as a monk, you know, you know, celibacy, um, no alcohol, no self pleasure, you know, all these things. And I'm like, that's it just too, ra kind of it's too radical for a 20 year old. Totally. You got to experience life a little right? bit. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's pretty extreme. Yeah. So like, I think, I mean, I met a lot of cool people, a lot of cool philosophies, but at the end of the day, I think it's just about, you know, forgiving yourself and then um, letting go. I mean, just mm -hmm. letting go. Those two words are like a mantra I have, but easier said than done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's, um, I like I like the term let it be. Um, oh, there you go. Good Beatles tune. It is, it is. And you know, the Beatles seem uh seem to me in my mind to have been uh kind of visionarily writing about the future to kind of get people like in the right vibe, if if that makes any no, sense. No, they they went to India and they got turned on to a guru there. I forget yeah. his name, Mari something. Mar Marty John, Hoff yeah so, yeah and John Something Lennon like was at, John Lennon was at the forefront of all that he was like way ahead of his time unfortunately oh, yeah. RP, what a and great soul I feel like the vibrations that they made um really changed so like an entire generation's mindset you know and um and yeah one of my favorite songs is let it be and it it um it, to me it's just kind of a perfect phrase for just when you get that, that like anxiety or that, you know, whatever, and you just think, just let it be like, cause it's going to be what it's going to be and, you know, move on. There's, um, uh, kind of release expectations. Um, anyway, I think, I think those vibrations have set the tone for getting people acclimated and ready to be present in where we are today and like potentially like almost post Corona life, you know? Right. through that portal of um of what corona has been to the world you know yeah it's definitely i mean i try to see the silver lining in it i think it's the pause button that the world needed but with very drastic backlashes on the demise of some wonderful people you know that's that's mm -hmm. a terrible side effect and um the silver lining is that it has made people hit the pause button and like you said let it be letting go mm -hmm. and as big as a struggle as it's been for myself and many others at the end of it it's like all right i hung in there i stayed my course i'm still here what did i get out of this and what can i utilize it moving forward instead of when the fuck am i going to get my vaccine so i can get back to life um you know, and people just tripping out and losing their shit and just, I don't know, resorting yeah. to way too much alcohol or, or whatever. 
all these nightmare stories, but let it be is a good one. I'm going to, I'm going to yeah. put that on my uh, Spotify when we get off. Uh, I don't know why, but many, many times this year, that song is, has been uh, just like a broken record through my head. And, um, and I think that's, what's kind of cool about, about music is even though that's the song I heard when I was a kid, I didn't think too much of it back then. Just my dad liked the Beatles, you know? And, um, but now all of a sudden I, there's like some serious meaning attached to it. And I, it's been kind of, kind of cool to like realize that. Oh yeah. I mean, lyrics are powerful when you resonate with them and get that underlying meaning. I mean, I think there's so much as a kid, I really, I really never tuned into lyrics. You know, I was just like kind of more into the groove, but now like, a days you know where you're like you can read the lyrics or see the lyrics it's like wow there's some meaning there let's let's go with this yeah i have a um a book it's a poet book of poetry but it's just the beatles lyrics oh, and wow. um, and it's uh it's like a really vintage copy I, I doubt it's even in print i've had it since i was in like middle school or something and it was even old when I got it, you know, so it's, it's gotta be a super old book, but I just, I covet that book. I, I love reading through their lyrics. They, um, it's, it's some powerful stuff, you know, and, and it's funny because I haven't thought of that book in forever. <laughs> wow. Yeah. You should dig it up. Show the kiddos. I totally need to, because now I'm like in my mind, like, where is that book? I know it's somewhere, you know, I have to find it. No, I mean, there's music is so healing, like community. That's one of the things I miss the most is being, you know, going to see live music and yeah, people just letting go like a Grateful Dead concert, you know, just like, woo, and uh, <laughs> such a release. I think that um, I, I kind of foresee uh, festivals, like outdoor festivals being a little more of a thing than like indoor big concerts, you know what I mean? Like um, moving forward, I, that's just kind of the, where I see it going. And I had this vision of, um, of what if before every concert, uh, somebody did a grounding meditation for the audience and the musicians. Cause you know how sometimes like, it takes a while for the musicians to come on because they're, they gotta get in that right zone and like, I have this theory and I really want to try it out someday on, I don't know what concert, but I, I have this theory that if you can ground the, um, like all the people present and then you can just like really let it all go and like, um, just totally vibe. I feel like it's possible. No, I think you're spot on with that crystal. I mean, that's a great way to immerse the community and get that mindset. Set. So something similar to that, I don't know if you ever heard of it, but there was a concert in Golden Gate Park called Free Tibet Okay. that the, Be that the Beastie Boys put on, you know, Adam uh, Yamaguchi, I forget his last name. He was full on Buddhist guy, right? Okay. And he's, he's integrated that into some of the songs. Uh, Bodhisattva Vows are really cool jam they do, but they put on this concert called Free Tibet, you know, and the whole premise was, you know, China's pretty much taking over and invaded tibet and they wanted to bring that whole awareness so they had i know bjork was there um the beastie boys obviously and then just a host of all other bands free concert all these monks jamming out doing these mandalas these beautiful sand you know the sand oh, uh, that's mandalas, awesome. massive yeah. sand mandalas and um so colorful and so beautiful and everyone was in that mindset because that was the premise of of the show free to yeah. and it's a free show and uh get involved and we were all signing petitions and um it was awesome so yeah i think you're i think you're on the right idea there as far as blessing the, cool. the crowd you know yeah, we have a, um, I work with a group, it's a clean water foundation, and um, they've been working like all during Corona to get um, clean water filters to the Hopi and Navajo tribes. And, oh. um, and we have, and this is, this is really a neat thing is we have a permit um, to play a celebration concert after the reservation is opened up um, at the Hopi um like medicine center it's their retreat center 
and I uh, and I want to try that at that um, at at that event. Um, I want to start it with a grounding meditation. And I think everybody else that's working on planning it with clean water, I think they're all on board with it. So I think I'm going to be able to test out my theory. And it sounds like literally, it, literally test the waters. Yes, exactly. <laughs> cleansing the waters, cleansing the soul, cleansing the minds, right? Yep, exactly. That's so cool. Yeah. And so uh, I'm, I'm really hopeful about this and, uh, hearing what year did they do that free tibet thing yeah that's a great question that was a long time ago um yeah. i want to say early 2000s maybe that sounds probably right that's cool and uh yeah it was awesome i ended up like just being myself like okay i'm in here for free what can i do next how can i get a free backstage pass or a free <laughs> meal and I finagled my way all the way back there and um, to all the huge spread for all the artists and whatnot. And I'm sitting down at a table and this dog comes running up to me and I start playing with the dog and having a good time. And it was, um, I think MC Mike from the BC Boys dog. And he comes okay. over and he's just like, oh, he's so playful. Isn't he a great dog? I, and I'm like, yeah, right on, man. You guys are doing amazing stuff. And then I hear this woman speaking next to me. I'm like, hey, how are you? What's going on? And um, she's got this really squeaky voice. And I'm like, whoa, it's like a cartoon character. And I'm just like <laughs> tripping out. And it was Bjork. <laughs> and I'm just rapping out with Bjork. It was just like, no big deal, you know? And they were all there, I think, playing for free pretty much for the cause. So, Of course. Yeah, that's what you right? do, you know? Yeah. Benefits, right? Mm-hmm. Because, you know, Go yeah, ahead. musicians are, well, I think of musicians as um, change agents, you know, they, they can change the vibrations, they can um, change people's perspective, even, uh, you know, much like any artist, but it's a different, when music's added, it's a different, um, it's just a whole different thing, little, a couple more dimensions, maybe, um, and, uh, and I think artists that, have something in their mind that they um they're like something that really pulls them like their cause their you know whatever it is that they're driving force when they're really in tune with that driving force I feel like they are they play really good music you know and oh, yeah. whether it's um whether it's your style of music or not you can always tell when it's super heartfelt and I, I think, think those free right. those free concerts are like those those artists like just really putting it out there so you get these performances that are just beyond you know expectations that anyone has it kind of blows people's minds when you get in that in that zone and and really you know speaking your your heart and soul yeah yeah I, yeah so true because across all genres of music i think you do get that focal point of people tuning in and resonating with the musicians, like feeling if it's metal, you know, I've been to some amazing Metallica concerts and they played with the SF Symphony before the pandemic. And uh, I went and saw that and was just so moved by you've got, you know, these metal gods, Metallica playing with the uh, San Francisco Symphony and it was beautifully cool. orchestrated and they just wove in and out of each other and they just played off each other. And all of a sudden you just feel this like, different level of appreciation because you're like feeling chills yeah and that's some powerful like stuff powerful you know and then you've got you know doesn't matter what type of music as long as you're feeling that energy like you yeah. said yeah powerful that's cool. powerful stuff yeah that's um i i do look forward to to those times coming back that's um hopefully not too far off but i'm I kind of think it by the end, October, November, I think maybe we might be able to pull off our festival. We'll see. Yeah, no, you're, I've seen some lineups starting to come out for even mm -hmm. summer festivals. Yeah. So the optimism, yeah. optimism is there, but who knows how that environment's going to play out. It'll be super interesting to see how they pull it off and what do they implement, you know, moving forward. Yeah, but the only tricky part is when you start to throw alcohol into the mix, 
which I'm fine with, but, you know, people just start dropping their guards way too much. And hopefully we can get back to that again. But I think, like you said, the onset is like, okay, we're here to celebrate. We've all got through this. Let's try to carry this um, group mindedness forward. Yeah, yeah, that that um, that's one thing that that I've realized is that there is a level of um, awareness and consciousness that that I haven't seen on such a large scale. I like to travel a lot, and I come across people throughout the years that um, that are on that kind of same wavelength that I think I tap into a lot. And um, but just during Corona time it seems like it's been exponentially growing and these um this mindfulness and this like uh state of of um vibration maybe is uh seems to be hitting what i call like a tipping point or a critical mass or something like that and i don't know if it's just because the people i'm surrounding myself with and that's kind of why i wanted to have this like virtual campfire is like get a feel for like everybody out there that I've connected with over the years, like what, you know, where are we all at? Are you feeling as strong as I am? Cause, cause it seems pretty big to me. No. And that's a great point, Crystal. I mean, I think I'm a firm believer and everything happens for a reason. I mean, it may sound corny or kind of hokey, but when you really start to tap into the true meaning of that, like, why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to families? Why is this happening to the world? I mean, mm-hmm. a lot of, you can't get much more than a bigger global event than we're having yeah. or, or have had, right? Yeah, exactly. And, was, and with my anxiety and my anxious mind at first, I was like, I closed up. I was like freaked out, fear mongering, bought into all that and was just like cloistered myself and just like heightened anxiety through the roof, like, God damn it. And uh, felt like I slipped a hundred steps backwards. But now that I'm integrating, I'm out here hanging out with cool peeps like you, Chris and Alina, they're boys. And you guys have a great tribe. What you what you guys got going on, the woo-woos. <laughs> I saw you guys play the other night and I was just mesmerized by the energy. And even though, you know, you guys are just getting started, it's it resonated true. And it doesn't matter because your intentions are pure, right? Yeah, yeah. That's that's the thing is um is when you play with that feeling that that sense of purpose that I was saying it it's so visceral and um and I think that you know like even though I haven't been playing music hardly very long uh it's always been in me it just is now coming out you know you know what I mean so so really it's a lifetime in the making it's not it's not like just started if that makes sense no of course not you're you're picking up your your passion so you've got all this build up to this moment i mean it's all been building up and now you're now you're starting to uh be the artist that you are i mean you are a very artistic person from what i know of you oh yeah and that's I mean... just, it's just another way of expressing i mean I was over at Chris and Alina's a few nights ago having dinner and um, we were just all hanging out by the fire and Alina picks up her flute and um, and it sounded amazing. I was like, holy shit. I think I'm listening to Carlos Nakai, who's this amazing Native American flutist, right? Yeah. And I'm just starting to like groove on this and Chris is like, he's, whoa, my wife's playing this? This is bitching. Yeah. So doesn't take much her intentions are pure I know her you know so yeah it's cool it's very cool it's it's um you know you never know where things where things uh end up but the journey the you know for me the musical journey of um just creating vibrations that I feel inside of myself is uh is is pretty fun so I'm having a super super good time with it yeah I studied with a qigong master for a while uh Larry Wong in San Francisco amazing amazing being just resonates energy but he's so grounded and down to earth snowboards uh surfs and um he blew me away but the takeaway from his teachings was like everything is about intention Mm -hmm. you know if you set your intention doesn't matter if you're doing the movements wrong or if you're not totally in stride if your intention from your inner heart is to like, you really want to do this, 
it'll all come together. And like at yeah. the end of the day, at the end of the day, it was like, okay, what was your intention? Was it pure? Maybe you didn't execute properly, but your intention was was pure. So it doesn't matter. Yeah. No, it's right? it's it's super true. It's like um, you know, I love how you say you can <laughs> can do a couple of the of the things wrong, but like just as long as as what you had going through your mind and um, even more than your mind when it's connecting to your heart, uh, then you get um, the kind of a, I guess, magic a little bit. Ooh, yes. <laughs> or maybe that's, I mean, that's kind of woo woo for sure. But <laughs> like, you know. <laughs> well, that's the beauty of it though, right? I mean, yeah. you make your you make your own magic. If it feels magical to you, it's magic. It's you know, true. Cast, it's cast, true. cast your spell on me, Crystal. I want some of that woo woo. <laughs> right? I mean, honestly, you're making me want to like get off this call and set up all my bowls and play my flute and start. You know, yeah. like sometimes you just have days like that where you're just like, I'm just gonna jam all day. You know, it's well, yeah. um, give yourself permission to do it. You know. That we'll see, and actually, that's a that's a super super uh, insightful point is to give yourself permission because, like, I know, like, I'm a mom, I have three kids, I own a business, you know, two businesses really. Um, I'm I'm busy, you know. You are. And, you are. And so I, um, and I'm a writer, you know, like I do all these things. I have many many hats, but the one hat that I put at the very top of my little hat tree is, um, is like some time for myself. And I don't feel bad about it at all. I feel like if I'm able to like sit and meditate for 20 minutes in the morning and I will be such a better mom throughout the day. Yeah, Otherwise, right. you know, who knows, I might snap at the kids and yell at them and you know, whatever. But, um, but yeah, I think, I think, the the music part for me has turned into like the evening kind of just unwinding being able to just kind of chill for a minute yeah there's that beautiful book end analogy of you know starting your day with your intention and your mindset and setting those goals or whatever you have planned for the day and tuning in with that and starting off your day i'm guilty of not doing that nearly enough but then like you said at the end of the day you grab that other book in and you're celebrating your whole day of whatever it was and you're just like boom here we go again yeah you know exactly like and then even if you're celebrating the little things you know like the fact that you didn't yell at the kids today you know right <laughs> or that you only yelled at them once <laughs> there you go i mean that's a victory right exactly I mean, i'm not a parent but i can only imagine and yeah. then and then they get the benefits of picking up on that good mojo that good energy you know so yeah, that's and then that, all there's the, that the i think every mom is a bodhisattva because they're their bond with their with their kids is so deep you know and you see that connection of course i have a mom and um <laughs> <laughs> we're still very close um you know the, the amount of dedication she's put towards me has never given up on me I'm like, holy shit, you know, that's like a lifelong. It's like you turn 18, they're still your mom. They're still wanting oh. the best for you. Yeah, I know. My um, oldest is turning 18 right now. And uh, and I told her, I said, I think a lot of people think when their kids turn 18, like they're kind of like done or something, you know, like they celebrate. And I'm right. like, now my job is just started. <laughs> that's what I told her. <laughs> there you go. She's, she's more probably on your level and you guys can resonate on it on more of a friendship bond, maybe. Exactly. Like right? we, um, yeah, she, um, she's very creative and she edits videos and, um, crochets and does all these things. And I'll get this idea of something that, you know, because I'm not a, a video editor. I, I've worked in TV production, but I'm just, I don't have that skill set to be an editor, or maybe it's the patience. But Sophia is like a full, we used to call her Buddha baby. And she'll sit and uh, put together, weave together a beautiful story on video. And um, wow. she's, she's a storyteller, you know, like in her heart and very creative. 
And so um, it's been really fun working on creative projects with my daughter, which is some, it's different than doing crafts with them as a child. You know, this is like, we're creating something that other people are gonna see. And, and she, when I tell her the messages or the feeling I want it to have, she nails it. It's, it's really exciting. She sounds, she sounds like an old soul. She is. Yeah. She's probably, you know, bringing in her past and um, mm -hmm. that's wonderful to hear about that. You know, the, the youthful people that are tapping into that because, you know, maybe she's an influencer or whatever you want to label it, but she's doing the influencing uh, on behalf of others, not mm -hmm. just for her likes and her, her followers, you know, it's like, exactly. And that's the beauty of social media. You know, it's this double-edged sword. You get the bully in, but then you've got these beautiful people like your daughter putting out her messages and making it available to anybody, right? That wants to be available to tap into it. It's like, okay, I scroll, I see this. And I'm like, whoa, why am I checking this out? Okay. I'm like, boom. Yeah. Not just, you know, not just a heart like and move on. It's like, I'm going to stop. I'm going to check this person out. I'm going to bookmark it. Yes, yeah, like go back and see a different post on another yeah. day. I think one of the things that I decided to embrace um, during this whole shift that we've been going through is um, to embrace technology a little more because I always had like a kind of a negative um, reaction to technology. I don't, I don't know why, but just it was like my, the way I thought about it. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to like, shift my mind a little bit. I'm gonna think about all of the really positive things that this brings us. And that's all of a sudden when things started changing for me a little bit, where I was like, okay, I could do a podcast. I could do this, this, you know, the technology's here. Why not? I mean, look at us, we're on a Zoom call right now, looking at each other talking. I mean, I remember like in the eighties, they were talking about the future of video phone calls. You'll be able to see the <laughs> other person. I'm like, hell no not in a million years and here we are like what is going on yeah we're like we're like the jets i mean i can right give now. you a virtual hug right now totally. <laughs> <laughs> i mean to embrace it like that because i mean i've got i've got tons of nieces and nephews and of course they they're you know on their phones and but when i come into the room or when we hang out they're respectful enough to be like okay there's a human being um who i respect and i'm they, they, they put it aside and all of a sudden we're engaging and they don't need to be on the screen because we're playing ping pong or we're, we're going on a bike ride or um, listening to music. You know, my two uh, nephews are amazing musicians and they'll jump on the piano and the other one will get on the guitar. And I'm just like, I love that. I think, I think music is a great equalizer. You know, we may have different viewpoints on political ideologies or whatever but you bring music into it and all of a sudden you can clap your hands you can stomp your feet you can pick up a tambourine and all of a sudden all those other things fade away it's like the great equalizer right yeah i mean didgeridoo look at the history of the dids that thing's aboriginal histories i mean they used to do um healing on uh, on people with the dig. and when i was in australia i saw this guy play the didgeridoo on a, on a pregnant lady and you could see oh, wow. her belt you could see her belly starting to the, the baby started like kicking and it was pretty fascinating that's cool coolest things i've ever been to is the uh, new orleans jazz fest and the um the amazing musicians that come together of generations you know um the nevilles you know the neville brothers and their families and from the youngest to the oldest and just seeing i went into the gospel tent and that was one of the most moving shows i'd seen that whole venue was just this jam there's like a she had to be in her 80s and she was just wailing she played the bass she played the drums she was running around and i was just like <laughs> energy literally in there was like a blues brother movie yeah, that's, you know, that's so funny because um, that just reminded me of a time when I was in Peru and uh, we were in a maloca, like a round um, ceremony room. And when we walked in, there was this woman who um, she looked almost dead, quite honestly. She was like kind of slumped in the 
uh, along the wall and uh, hanging her head and was just um, kind of sleeping or something. And um, we all came in and uh, our the shaman came in, uh, Kush and his wife, and they started this beautiful ceremony. And then all of a sudden, that woman that was sitting in the corner started making she she started like coming alive like she yeah. was like dancing and um making these throat she was a throat singer from the amazon oh, wow. and she was like in her 90s and and during the ceremony i swear it was for hours she just was like so all over the maloka and checking in on everybody and singing this like i don't very guttural sound that I didn't even know a human can make. And, and then I don't think, I don't know when she went away, but I didn't see her again. And it was like, almost like, was she really here? What, you know, like it was this. Right. Crazy, yeah. It was really wild. That's fascinating. I mean, the group energy and then there's a healer present and then there's other people sending in their group energy. It's like a collaborative, right? Yeah. So yeah. when you really, when you really pinpoint all that energy and someone's in tune and they pick up on it, it's uplifting, right? Yeah, very. It's like, I mean, they talk about mob mentality in a negative way, but there's the complete opposite of, you know, uh, uplifting, you know, bum rush of energy that, that can uplift people's spirits. And like you said, you witness that and you're like, whoa. Yeah. I feel like it's kind of like, like light workers, like myself, like that's what we're kind of like the cheerleaders right now. <laughs> like, come there on, you go. let's go. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, it doesn't take much. It's just, I mean, here's the thing that I, I used to love to do this and I still to this day, just me being me. It's, I would just, I always am out in my, in my car driving a lot. I'm always traveling and I'm jamming to fun music and I just wave to people. And this is pre pandemic and, you know, maybe, maybe a quarter of the time I'd get a wave back and I'd be like, hell yeah. Uh, <laughs> and other times you see these people, like they go for that half wave and they're like, wait, I don't know you. And they pull their hand back. <laughs> like, I'm not going to give you a friendly wave. I don't know you. And I'm just like, wait a second. It's a free offering. But now during Corona, I do that. I don't think I've had one person not wave back to me. Right. You know, even That's though I'm awesome. on a, even Hide my mask they can maybe see my eyes but they see a friendly gesture and they're like whoa this guy's here so that's the beauty of this pandemic going out for walks and seeing people like you know making that uh kind gesture of like you're here i'm here we're in this together yeah i mean i i do think it's um you know maybe one of the first times that such a global situation has happened that wasn't um a uh, I mean, a, a, a pandemic is horrible. I'm not saying it wasn't horrible, but it wasn't a war. It wasn't a meteor hitting the earth. It wasn't, you know, massive, right. mass destruction. You know, it, it was um, um, more in our heads than anything else. No, and that's a, a very good point because I mean, I work in the field a lot with, with natural disasters. And it's amazing to see these communities come together under those circumstances, you know, the outpouring of help and generosity and, and giving. And then you think, well, why does it take something drastic for these measures to occur? I'm not negating any of the uh, forthcoming efforts of these people. It's a beautiful thing to witness. But if they could just carry that over into everyday life, um, that would be amazing, right? Yeah. And I'm, 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 I'm by no means uh, an angel or practice what I preach, but my intention is there. So hopefully the momentum of my intentions start to see fruition just through daily kindness. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's exactly how I feel. Cause I feel like I, I'm, I'm just have a good, a good intention every day. I don't have expectations about where my day is going to go. And I, um, at the end of the day, just celebrate wherever I was. And um, when I stay in that pattern, it's, um, it's, it's a very peaceful way to live. And I, it's fun. I like it. Yeah. I mean, that's, your energy is uh, contagious. 
Every time I see you, it's it's there's something positive. And I saw Crystal today. Oh wow. Okay. What is she up to, this crazy gal? <laughs> totally. You're spinning, you're spinning a great weave right now. And you, yeah, the, and your energy is contagious and you you put it forth and you're non-judgmental, you're very kind. And um, that's a great gift. Well, I'm um thank you that's a, that's a very nice compliment i um i know that uh i have a motto that i go where the day takes me and sometimes i'm like how did the world bring me to this point today i have no idea but just make the best for it and uh and and i think you're right there aren't any coincidences like everything just kind of happens you might not know why but then later on you figure it out well, yeah, and that's called life, right? I mean, do we embrace it or do we, you know, beat ourselves up? Exactly. You know, what, what, what was the lesson? Do I negate? Do I be pessimistic or do I embrace it regardless of, of the outcome? And uh, as they say, you know, we keep getting these repeated lessons in life until we learn that lesson and uh, and move on and pay it forward. Yeah, and that's what you're Pay doing. I mean, you're you're doing a podcast. Never in a million years would I think I'd be a guest on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> What's a podcast? Well, I guess we're just talking and we're putting our ideas and our visionaries. And it's like I have these thoughts in my mind, but I haven't shared them. And now you're making this possible for me to to share whatever I have to give, and, I, and hopefully it's positive. Yeah, I had a vision one time that I was supposed to tell other people's stories, and um. It came to me in like a very deep meditation and I um, I was confused by it a little bit because I'm a writer and I usually write my thoughts down. I'm, I consider myself very much better at writing than at speaking. And um, then I realized one day that I wasn't supposed to tell other people's stories. I was supposed to listen to other people's stories and I am just, the medium in which more people can hear these stories. You're so the, you're the, you're the, I'm, the I'm the I'm the connector that is supposed to bridge the gap between these two worlds, you know? And so um, I think when I realized that I was like, oh, that's why I studied broadcast journalism in college. I thought it was random. That's why I have done all this traveling. I thought it was random, you know? So. So all these things I've done in my life have started to really like make a lot of sense and connecting the dots in retrospect has been, you know, in hindsight, it's all been like kind of the perfect path. <laughs> no, I don't know I how. Think, I think you touched on a really key element on that, what you just said, as far as listening. And I think that's a lost art in our society. Um, and I think that's one of the beautiful things about mindfulness is that you try to be present with that other person and be mindful and respectful and let them speak. Cause I, I I'm guilty of wanting to get in my say, you know, whether it's a, a conversation, a constructive argument or whatever, but like awkward silence is kind of cool sometimes, you know? That's true. It's very true. Cause you know, we don't we don't always know what to say yeah you know like like if, if you kind of stop and think for a second you change your mind of what you would say and like and that's where i think the mindfulness comes in is that pause well put exactly because if we can we can breathe for five to 10 seconds and, and dissipate our anger or whatever hurtful thing we possibly might say and we swallow our pride. It's like, that's huge. Because you, you, th you think about the ramifications of acting out in anger, saying something hurtful, you never feel good about it, but oh, it's, yeah. st it's still got done and that energy is released. You're releasing this negativity and that could, the ramification of that person could take that. And then he's going to be, you know, the old saying is your boss yells at you. 
you go home, yell at the wife, the wife yells at the kids and the kids kick the dog, you know, where does it stop? Right. Dog, dog chases the cat, cat chases the mouse, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, but if your boss gave you like a high five, good job, you know, you go home, you smile at your wife, you kiss her. She, you know, you sit down at dinner, the kids tell the story of the day, the dogs there, and it's, you know, a happy family. Yeah. Yeah, it really, I mean, one negative thing, uh, if it's not transmuted, because um, I, I think sometimes uh, negative things aren't always bad. Sometimes it's something that needs to come to light. It needs to stop being in the dark, you know, so you've got to bring it out. But um, but I think once that that negativity is turned into a um, into something else, like it it shifts, um, it, it takes on a new vibration, whatever whatever that is. I think um, that's when healing happens and. Oh, yeah. So I think those things do need to come out. No, no, I agree with you hundred percent. And that's when other people are receptive of it. It's, it's, it's the being skillful of presenting that constructive criticism. You know, you're right. It does need to come out because if you harbor it, you know, it's inner poison, right? right. And, and you suffer. So I need to let it go, whether it's through journaling or meditating or being expressive towards that person. Mm-hmm. Um, but how, you know, if your intention's pure and you're skillful about it, that person's going to be on the receiving end. Yeah. And, and, the, and yeah, I mean, that's, that's transformation, you know, it's, um, but we're human and the path right? doesn't always go how happy go lucky, you know, that you think it's going to. So the, that's, those are our struggles. <laughs> Well, that's where forgiveness comes in too, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Full circle and all this. Yeah. I think, I think like, I mean, I'm almost 55. I think I got a tiny bit of experience in life and maybe a, a, a sand grain of wisdom to like put out there. It's like, you don't have to be full on. You don't have to be extreme. You don't have to like shave your head and and go to the airport and be a higher krishna you know um nothing against higher christians i think they're wonderful amazing people but um i i my personality has that pendulum swing that i go from one extreme to the other like all in and then all of a sudden dropping the ball and i think the buddhist philosophy of the middle path you know finding that balance yeah, I, the middle I can thing. meditate, I can be group minded, but then I can go out and have a beer with my buddy and not feel bad about it. Or I, or I can cuss and, and feel like, well, I'm not going to hell, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think there's a lot to say about the middle, the middle ground and um, what, uh, what that does when you're just a little more in balance. Um, the, the thing that I find difficult in life is that like, you know, that one thing that you think you're in balance and then all of a sudden you just like get sideswiped, you know, and you're like, what? I did not yeah. see that coming. And then you just sort of readjust again. Um, you know, I think, I think that's always just going back and forth. Yeah. I mean, they, you know, rolling with the punches, right? It's like, yeah. okay. I, 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 and we're always our worst critics, right? I mean, no one's going to berate ourselves like our own selves. So I think we need to learn how to literally give ourselves daily hugs and uh, pats on the backs, you know, especially, you know, with people that are still isolated. I think we're starting to come out of this, but mm -hmm. I mean, I had times where I would just break down and cry and I'm like, why am I so rattled right now? Why am I all this energy? I'm just like, I got to release it, man. And I would just have the best cry and just be like, wow, that was powerful. You know, like real yeah. men don't cry bullshit, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, and if things get bottled up, call a friend, you know, reach out. Um, yeah. It's, it's so true. Cause I'm, I, 
I found myself a lot of times wondering like, why is the day seem so long? Like what, like, I just need to rest. Like I can't get through this day kind of thing. And, um, and historically I've never been like that. I go from dust till dawn, like, I mean, I know that's the opposite, but I really go like kind of 24 seven and, and I historically actually don't sleep all that much. Um, but I found during this last year, I, um, I've like doubled my hours of sleep, which is um, kind of interesting for me. But I think I'm communicating more with different dimensions when I'm sleeping than I used to. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's, they even have something called sleep yoga, which is more mental. You know, it's not the physical yoga, but, you know, there's all these mystics and, and histories about sleep yoga and you get tuned in and you're, you're totally dialed in and your subconscious kicks in and you're going on these amazing journeys, right? Yeah, it's pretty cool. I mean, I've, I've um, been able to lucid dream my whole life, but- There you um, go but the, yes. the yeah the level of it for me uh has changed recently and um it, it's uh I kind of look forward to going to sleep I'm like oh my gosh I wonder what's gonna happen next <laughs> do you do you so if I've, I've read a little bit about lucid dreaming and heard more about it but do you set your intention before you go to sleep to go into that yeah you know sometimes I do and sometimes I don't um because some days I'm just like really just super tired and um, I'll sleep really hard for probably like three or four hours and then kind of lucid dream at the at the end of the night, like early morning time. And um, that is more like for me, a freestyle kind of like things just sort of happen. And um, but then there's other nights where I um and maybe not as exhaustedly tired. And so I kind of slowly get into my dream cycle and uh, or into that REM sleep. And it's that lucid dreaming in the beginning of the night. And those are more the ones that I feel like I can control a little more and like have intentions for and, and maybe try to like, sometimes I'll have a question in my mind, like what should I do in this situation or something like that? And then I just let it come to me in a dream form and uh, that has been effective for me. Well, that's cool. So I'm just curious when you do have like one of these great connections and you're resting your REM state and you have a lucid dream, do you, do you wake up feeling rested or do you wake up feeling exhausted? I mean, what's the takeaway? I feel rejuvenated. Like I wake up and I'm like ready Recharge. to run. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it's a, it's a healing. For sleep. me, it is. I don't, I don't know if like, that's for everybody. I, um, yeah, I just kind of do it. I, I don't, I haven't read a lot about it. I, I do read a lot. So, well, you're um, not, and I like to, <laughs> you're not forcing it. So it's coming natural. So that's yeah, pure, right? Happening. Yeah. Yeah. It's just happening to me. And it's, and I just discovered it like this last year, um, at the very beginning of the pandemic, uh, one of my friends um, from New Zealand, he um, sent me the uh, 21 day meditation challenge, you know, and um, it's funny because he's a client of mine, didn't really know me personally very well. And I don't think he knew that I was already into meditation. Um, he he kind of sent it to his friends as like, hey, give meditation a try, you know, like kind of spreading the word right. about it. And um and it was really interesting because I was like, oh, this is such a good reminder to do this every day. Because even though I've been meditating for years, I don't always do it every day. And so it was the first time in a really long time where I was very conscientiously meditating at the same time every day for 21 days. And uh, it kind of kicked me into this like deeper meditation and um, just really embracing those practices more. And it just so happened to coincide when right when the pandemic happened. So I wasn't working quite as much and I had a little more time. And uh, and so it was like, like a boot camp for my mind. <laughs> yeah, no, I think the I, that's a great point. You know, there was all these 
challenges, all these different things to, to get more group minded through the pandemic. And I think there's something really powerful to be said about accountability. Mm -hmm. Like we can try to hold ourselves to be accountable, but when we're having to answer to others, from my personal experience, I know that sometimes I need that accountability from outside forces to like, maybe I would slack off, you know, let it, there was like a full month where I was doing 20 minutes of meditation every morning and feeling so much better. And then I just dropped out. Mm -hmm. I mean, just drop the ball. Yeah. All right. Okay. We can get back on that. You know, and yeah. then maybe maybe just being like, all right, let's just do five. Yeah, start small. Right. Yeah. I think that's one of the other key takeaways is like you said, start small and build momentum. Mm -hmm. You know, because when we we overwhelm ourselves, you know, it's kind of like that New Year's resolution where you're all in, right? I got the gym membership. I'm gonna be at the gym every other day and then you know we're at the grocery store we're doing all these things and next thing we know we haven't used our gym membership in months so yeah at the same time you can still go back yeah you know? the other thing um that that i find useful um for myself and i don't know other people might um learn from it is that uh there's lots of gateways to meditation. Like you don't just have to be sitting still. You can do a walking meditation. You can do, you know, if you play music, that's meditation. You know, there, there's all these different ways to yes. kind of integrate it into your day. So on days when I'm really busy and I think, oh, I, there's no way I can meditate today. I just, I'll find a little window, whether it's like the five minutes that I'm waiting for my daughter to come out from school or something and just really you know, use that time to reconnect to myself and kind of clear my head. And then, you know, so it, you're right. It doesn't have to be like this massive dedication. Like yeah, what you yeah. get. <laughs> that's, that's wonderful. There are so many gateways that you said, I think, I think the easiest one for me is just going out in nature, mm -hmm. you know, and we're up here in the Pacific Northwest. There's, there's no lack of beauty surrounding us. The minute I step outside my door, I'm like, I could see the Olympic range. I could see Rainier. I can see the Cascades. I'm just like blown away. And I'm like, all right, I'm in church right now. It's, you know, yeah. mother it's nature's true. just blissed out here. Yeah. And yeah. Um, yeah, so just tapping into to simplicity too, right? Definitely. Keeping things more simple gives you less reasons to have reactions. <laughs> no, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why complicate it all? Like that was the one thing like I, I tripped out and got so hung up on these um when I was in the the Tibetan Buddhist, we would have these ceremonies, right? And you would have these sand mandalas and you would be doing all this work while you're reciting reciting your your mantras and doing all this stuff. And I'm just like, there's way too much going on here right now for me to like <laughs> multitask and, and, and get the takeaway of, of all this. And I'm just like, I just want to relax, man. Yeah. <laughs> Put this shit down <laughs> and you watch know, you guys do it. <laughs> totally. I, um, I took my middle daughter, uh, to Mount Koyasan in, uh, Japan, um, a couple of years ago. And it's a, um, Mount Koya is a, it's a Buddhist, um, they, they have like a Buddhist like university. I don't know what, like a school, like a Buddhist oh. school. And it's where their, their monks, um, come and study a lot of times for life. Sometimes they come and then go out to other monasteries and stuff, but, um, they invite people in to stay in the, their like huts or their temples and, um, and then you can go however long you want, you can stay there. But like, like you were, you said you were a lay, a layman or right. whatever. So Eloise and I went as lay people for the weekend <laughs> and, um, and we had our monk, uh, Nori. And every time he'd say his name, he would touch his nose. He'd say, I'm Nori and touch his nose. And it was, it was really funny. <laughs> Eloise and I would laugh every time he'd do it. And, um, and he um 
we, we did meditations. We did a, a cemetery tour at midnight, which like freaked Eloise out so much. She almost wouldn't go. She was like 13, I think when we went and I, uh, and I finally like, I'm like shoving her out the door and like, come on, you got to do this cemetery tour. And she held my hand like halfway through it. And then wow. at the end was like, that was the coolest thing ever, you know? And like, um, but, but that weekend was so special to, to just like wake up meditating, meditate throughout the day before we'd eat meditate, you know, and, and doing that with my daughter was, uh, it was a cool experience. And now she's 16 and can't wait to move back to Japan. It's all wow. she wants to do is go back there. Yeah. yeah, that the culture over there is amazing, right? I mean, it's so group minded with, you know, the, the, the youth and the elderly and they're more common to live generationally with each other, right? And it's not mm -hmm. seen as a negativity like it is here in the West, you know? Yeah. So it's and a beautiful union. It is. It's, um, it's funny because I've taken her to uh, China. I mean, not China, I'm sorry, Asia, um, Europe, South America. Um, it, she's been a lot of places in the world and it's it's the one, the only place of all the places I've taken her that she's like, I have to go back. Like, really? like she's she's been studying Japanese like um, all through this Corona, like she's just been learning Japanese. She makes Japanese food all the time. Um, she watches anime constantly. It's like, she's just immersed herself in their culture and is just, she's found this university that she thinks she's going to go to in Tokyo. Oh. It's like, it's really kind of wild to watch how like, you know, it really magnetized her. That's yeah. Wow. That's resonated with her. That's amazing. There's definitely a gravitational pull when you're there. I mean, there's well, I think it's the largest city in the world, right? Tokyo. I can't imagine any bigger city than that. So well, crowded wise, <laughs> population wise, and you're just like, it's not like New York. Well, it's, I mean, it's not the hustle and bustle of the West. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a different style of hustle and bustle where there's honor and respect and you it's feel like, like oh, people are walking like, like with purpose, but they're right. not like viewed. Yeah, and people are, you know, they're real. They're they'll, you know, they'll they still bow and there's honor and um it's it's pretty awesome. Yeah. Have you spent time in Japan? Sounds like you have. I've been there twice and um maybe recently three years ago, I went on a snowboard trip, but we spent two or three days in Tokyo and the mountain the Japanese Alps are magical. I mean, you go from the city, talk about hustle and bustle of Tokyo proper, and then you go up two hour train rides up into the, uh, up near Nagano, where they had the Olympics, the um, mm -hmm. Hapuka Valley, and you've got all these small little mom and pop resorts, you know, not like the West where we've got these mega resorts, and you're very humbled by it, you know, you've got the the elderly guys working the lifts and it's, you know, it's all pride. And then you yeah. go up and you have this amazing ramen or sashimi lunch and, you know, you're not having burgers, but you're experiencing the culture. And there's like, a, instead of a water fountain, they've got a green tea station, you know, encouraging people <laughs> to drink green tea. And we're just like, this is awesome. That's cool. Yeah. That sounds like, a, that's a good trip right there. Yeah. We've got a good trip in your pipeline soon. Oh yeah, I'm going to Shasta. Yeah. That's oh my God, I can't believe we're just talking about this right now. <laughs> okay. So um yeah, so initially I thought I was gonna go up the mountain. You know, right. I, I thought that's what I was gonna do. I was going with the intention of clean water. It's like my mission in life. Like it's like my name is Crystal and it's crystal clear now to me what my mission is. And you know, like like I said, all the little dots have been adding up for me. And um and and still I'm I'm wrong constantly. So it's it's really wonderful. Uh and then I got connected with um a friend of mine who lives down in Mexico, um, said 
I think like, do you know this guy at Mount Shasta, the shaman? And I'm like, no, I don't know him. And um, he's called Paul from Venus and he's on Instagram. You can, you know, look him up on Instagram. And she's like, I think you need to talk to him because I have very close like medicine people and shaman that I've worked with that have worked with him. And um, it just seems like you, you guys need to connect. And I was like, okay, this is real. I need to like send him a message. And so I sent him a message that, that very day. And within about uh, less than two days, we have a four day trek planned. Um, and he's taking me not up the mountain, but into the mountain. And uh, we're visiting, um, I think it's three high energy vortexes yes. um, that all have different, like you talk about intentions, they all have different kind of modality or intentions attached to them. Um, this is how I understand it. And, um, and I'm doing all of this with my intention of clean water. And so I feel like it's going to be really powerful because he lives on the mountain and knows it really well. And with like a really pure intention and um, a lot of heart, uh, you know, um, for me, um, I think our two energies together is going to be like, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen, right. but it's exciting. Well, you don't have to summit Shasta to have a good takeaway. I mean, the fact that you're going to be, sounds like you're going to be circumnavig circumnavigating the mountain and yep. checking into these cool portals of energy. I mean, that's a summit in itself. If you if you discover that energy and tap into it and feel the power. I mean, I've been on Shasta many times and there's definitely an aura about that place. You know, you hear about it, but until you experience it firsthand, in, you know, it creates its own weather up there. It's a radical, radical place. And uh, things change constantly. So they're like, there's all these energy vortexes. And if you tap into them, there's a lot of power. There's a lot of, uh, you know, you go into the town of Shast itself and it's kind of this throwback town, you know, you just see kind of gypsies and hippies and health food stores and, but you can see why they're there. I mean, they're drawn there for a reason and they stay there. It's a harsh winter, but um, there's all these hot springs and waterfalls and That'll be cool what you're doing. I mean, going into the mountain, who would have thunk? No, I know. That's what I would. And then the funny thing is, is when he told me that I was like, you know what? That's exactly what I'm supposed to do. Like the water, like if you think about water, it, it, you know, there's groundwater that comes up through the soil and gets filtered. And like, that's how you clean water. So yeah. it makes perfect sense to, to, if, if my intention is for clean water, I should be going where you filter it. Like, and so in my mind, I'm bringing like native drums and my native flute and um, some Tibetan singing bowls. And uh, I wanna go in and, um, and, and create those vibrations that are like filtering of the, you know, I don't know. That's my no, idea. <laughs> you're right, because I think there are some natural aquifers in Shasta. And I remember uh, on one trip with Chris, we were camping and they were hiking into this uh, natural water resource where there was an actual aquifer spring there. And they had instilled a pump where you can pump this fresh Shasta spring water and just drink this pure, pure, pure. And it was so delicious, right? To like... Yep. It's like, you know, you just picked a fresh fruit or something off the tree and you're like, whoa, this tastes phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. That's that pure, that pure water that is our, you know, that's what we're made of. Right. And so um, uh, the coolest part to me is that water can heal itself, you know, so even if it's dirty at one time, it can be purified. It can be so. Right. That's just, that's kind of my mission right now. I don't know why. <laughs> no, I mean, think about it. It's the most basic, like you said, we're mostly water. And I think we take it for granted here in the West that we've got a faucet we can just turn on or, you know, a filter or go into a store and buy bottled water. You know, it's just mm -hmm. like a given. It's like, 
but you go to third world countries and they're like drinking this muddy dirty water and it's just mm-hmm. wreaking havoc on their immune systems and you know their bodies having to filter it's which 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 we're not built for yeah um, you so know I, I think that's a great mission you're on how do they handle water because so the reason i'm asking is because what happened in texas just recently with right. a big storm and um i'm just thinking logistically like you know um what can because a winter storm is going to happen again a hurricane's going to happen again devastation across some sort of emergency something is going to happen again um so like how can we change our our um way of dealing with these disasters to to be more prepared for things like not having drinking water like like what i don't know i don't even know if there is an answer i'm just throwing that out there no 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 you're totally right so i think the key word there is preparedness right like thinking forward like they have these hurricane kits that you know they encourage people that live you know in florida and louisiana and in the panhandle you know to have ready and these people they expect them so they are they are in a sense prepared as much as they can be but you can never be prepared for mother nature because she can be so wrathful um you know and they had that huge boil mandate in texas you know these people Mm -hmm. are i think some counties are still having to boil their water and uh, we're lucky enough to have all these people like the red cross and so many volunteers that come in and educate all these people like no do not drink the water here's bottled water but then again the amount of plastic that's being put out there Mm -hmm. thousands you know you know um, they're not giving gallon jugs they're giving these small little bottles in in large amounts and then you think Uh. about the waste and where that's going so you've got a great point there i'm like how can we be more prepared and give people home filtration kits you know in the form of whether mm-hmm. it's a water reusable water bottle or um you know rainwater you know resources you know that a lot of people up here in the in the pacific northwest have mm-hmm. um, utilizing it, gray water where you need gray water you don't have to drink it you know like there's there's a lot of um yeah no that's um i mean these are not issues we can solve right away <laughs> No, but I think, you know, you're spot on. Like, you know, you start out with something so simple that most of us would be like, what is she talking about? We're at water. I've got it. I've got it right here in my shower in my home. But, you know, think about it. We just had that crazy disaster in Texas where uh, millions of people no longer are privy to to that um, resource that they thought they could just hit a switch. And And it's funny when I talk to people, they're like, God, I just took so much for granted. I didn't have power for four days and I just lost my shit. You know? You know, um, uh, Clean Water Foundation has these um, like gravity fed filter systems that they bring to all over the world, like South America, Africa. Um, I think ever since uh, 2010 or so, they've been doing this. And I think 54 countries or something they've they've gone to and um like why in the u.s doesn't fema or the red cross or something use things like this like do you see what i'm saying like no i totally see what you're saying and i think it all comes down to you know boils down to no pun intended is politics you know um, and sponsorships and you know, we've got all these people that are donating all these resources, which is awesome, but um, they also want their product to be out there and they want to be affiliated with, okay, we gave out so many kits and their hearts in the right place, but maybe the preparedness of this massive quantity of, of handout isn't the best for the long run. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it seems like it needs to be more. Uh, so if, if you have a disaster, your infrastructure can kind of crumble or whatever, but there there can be like temporary infrastructures that can be implemented, I think quite easily if it's kind of planned out and um, and there is that foresight to have some sort of measure in place. 
Well, it's the ama- it's amazing to see the resolve of people when they are in dire straits mm-hmm. to tap into all the resources and the creativity that we normally wouldn't utilize because we don't need to. Yeah. But when you're put on the spot and and it's coming down to survival for a lot of these people, you get pretty damn creative pretty damn quick, you know. Yep. Our uh our deeper minds we can tap into I think our yeah our biggest survival instinct is our creativity yeah I think so or so it's it's flight or fight or flight right I mean and if we go into fear and panic nothing's getting resolved right so Mm -hmm. you've got a tribe and you need to have a leader who can orchestrate the measures to bring everyone in and give them faith and uh, I'm kind of like that with Chris on Shasta. He 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 leads these trips, and we all just kind of follow in his footsteps because he's so positive, and like nothing bad can happen as long as I'm following Criffer on this mountain. <laughs> and uh, but if I get lost or separated, all of a sudden I'm kind of tripping out. Yeah. So. Yeah, just different takeaways, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's it's cool because I think um, you know, and I you touched on something. Um, maybe deliberately, I don't know, but um, we all have different roles. And, right. and that's, I think that's what's um, kind of kind of cool is, is when you kind of tap into, okay, what is my highest use? Like, what am I best at just intrinsically? Like, what, what skill do I have that comes easy to me? Because everyone has something that comes easy to them, you know? And so when you can ask yourself that question and then answer it, you're like, okay, now how can I help? Because that's that's when you're um, able to easily help out. It, you know, it's easy, and and things should be easy. I think. No, Sometimes. you're right. I mean, the saying goes, "It takes a village," right? Yep. I mean, left to our own accords, we can do some things really well, like you said. But then um, let's draw on other people's wisdom and knowledge and their talents, and as a tribe, we can get this shit done. Yeah. And uh, not try to be a control freak and do it all ourselves and then berate ourselves for not having all those tools and skills. I think that's huge. What you just said, like totally paramount to this whole conversation is like, what am I bringing to this universe? What am I what do I have that I can contribute and resonate and feel good about? Mm -hmm. Even though you may think it's very minute on some level, people are benefiting benefiting greatly from it yeah because I think what happens is sometimes when something comes so easily to somebody um they just assume it comes easily to everybody and I've I've been victim of that assumption before you know and I'm thinking because I tend to be very organized like I just am an organized person I'm not clean but I'm organized (laughs) there's a difference um but I think well how come when I go to my brother's house how come it looks like it does like he but for him organization is very difficult and and so I think I've learned over the years like that maybe something that I'm really good at someone else is it's very hard for them to do it but it's easy for me so I'll go help them do what's easy for me and then they can help me with what's easy for them and they're going to yeah, be different. instead of instead of pointing the finger, you know, of like, dude, what, what, why is your place in disarray? I mean, if you came over here right now, you'd probably trip like, okay, this, this isn't how I remember it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it doesn't take much just to like pitch in and be like, all right, let's put this over here. Let's call this home for these. Let's put the vitamins here. Let's yeah organize instead of like, what are you doing, man? <laughs> right. Yeah, like releasing that judgment and just being like, all right, let's uh let's get this together, you know. Right. It doesn't it doesn't, you know, it just takes some encouragement and you're like, wow, that was pretty easy. Maybe I can do that next time on my own. Yeah. Yeah, that's so it's kind of cool actually. Like I um, pre-pandemic, here's just an antidote. I never made grocery lists. I would just go into a grocery store with a mindset of what I thought I needed, and then I would mm-hmm. just succumb to spontaneous buys right <laughs> impulsive shopping so during That's this I, I started making <laughs> I started making grocery lists for the first time in my life 
and I like was on a mission. I knew where to go. I knew what to get. And I was like in and out of there and I didn't fall prey to nearly as much spontaneous crap. Uh -huh. And I was like checking them off. Got this, got this, got this. Okay. Boom. I can go to the checkout. Yeah. I mean, and it that, seems so um, basic, right? Like, right. Oh, you should make a grocery list. You're going grocery shopping, right? Yeah, totally. The problem with me is I make the list, but then by the time I get to the grocery store, I can't find it. Ooh. And uh, and then I just end up doing my um, random shopping. <laughs> yeah, I guess there's an app for that too, though, right? No, I know. And that's what my kids say too. They're <laughs> like, mom, just put it on your phone. And I'm like, you know still with this piece of paper of you know lists i don't know so yeah no i hear you 100 percent. i've been guilty of missing it and i'm just like god damn it <laughs> i know it's this you know embracing the technology i'm working on it every day i'm trying and i do just want to say thank you for um taking the time to chat and um just talk about life i don't know it's, no, it's it's an honor. I mean, I feel very privileged to be on this uh, conversation and to be able to express myself. I mean, I, I don't think we really prepared for this in the sense that we didn't have a, a list of questions or anything. It just kind of came naturally. And that's the beauty of these type of forums, like be yourself, be open, try to be honest and just yeah, you screw up, you screw up. We can add it. I'm happy that I'm friends with you, Kevin. Likewise, I look forward. I'm moving to uh, Alki at the end of the month, so I'll be in your neck of the woods. Sweet. That's yes. awesome. And uh, I want to share, so like after we go to Shasta, uh -huh. let's um, let's do this again. And For sure. you, because you're going, you're summiting Shasta. And we're gonna try. I think we're going in May. When, when, do yep. you have a date? Do you have a date set? Yeah, we're going. Um, the well, I think I'll be on the mountain from the twenty third to the twenty seventh, but I think oh. we're gonna stay a little longer. In May or April? May. May, perfect. Mm -hmm. I think they've had a pretty good, pretty good snow year, so it should be interesting. Yeah. Yeah, definitely bringing my snowshoes and uh, there will be a lot of snow in May still. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. All the way into June, July. Yeah. Yeah. And there's so, so many cool natural, you know, waterfalls and, and swimming holes and all kinds of cool natural stuff around there. Yeah, I'm excited. It's going to be, um, I think it's going to be really fun. Yeah, I'll be, I can't wait to hear about going into Shasta. I know. I'm uh so so we'll have to like share stories and for um, sure and I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna approach it this year differently because I'm gonna I'm gonna be thinking of you and these energy portals and I'm gonna be trying to tap into them and maybe do a little research and uh hone in on that cool yeah and think about clean water when you're there too okay there you go yeah I mean why not it's, yeah no it can't hurt it, it, we definitely that's one of the main things we do in Shasta is we bring filtrations because we can't haul up all that water right we have to yep. cook we have to melt yep. snow we have to uh melt snow and then boil it and then filter it so there's and it's amazing when you have to do these steps on the mountain like how much more you appreciate the meal yeah the water especially when you're hiking and you've got to hydrate you're just like oh my god that water was so good yeah. So good point. Yeah. Cool. This is going to be great. <laughs> yeah. Namaste. Thank you so much. Thanks, Crystal. Have a wonderful day. All right. You too. See you, Kevin. All right. Cheers. All right. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you for listening to my virtual campfire. I'm humbled and grateful and with heartfelt thanks thank you for listening all the way to the end um i hope that it caused a vibration or a thought or sparked something inside of you to make a positive change <laughs>